welcome to today's show. My name is Dave Emery. I'm from the Marshall Financial Group, and welcome to Money Matters TV. Um, my co-host tonight, today, is Patty Twandros. Hi, Patty. Nice welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to the show. Thanks. So, um, wanted to uh, hear a little bit about about your your firm. It's uh, Zercel. Tell yes. me a little bit about about what you folks do. Okay, so it's. 13 years old and I will tell you that I don't know where 13 years went I don't know if it was like that for you in your business but it flew by 13 short years huh? yeah 13 short years I got started my dad had a printing business so I started in graphic design when I was 13 it was my slave labor you know my dad would yell at me mm -hmm. go do this for me and then uh, <laughs> I would surprisingly get my allowance so nice. I yeah I started out early doing that and I fell in love with it I fell in love with print and then I mm -hmm. started out learning about internet and website when it first became kind of mainstream in right. 1996 is really when companies were paying obscene amounts of money for their websites. So it kind of took an interest and I love the idea of the instantaneous exposure yeah. and more so if there's a mistake, you can right. fix it right away, Very nice, which yeah. in print you can't. Yeah. So when I started my company, we were really heavily focused in web development and building websites that worked for customers. So it wasn't just some sort of general solution. It was very much about solving a problem in their industry. Yeah. Wow, yeah. it sounds like you got in right at the beginning. And yeah. You've seen a lot of change, a lot of growth in, in your firm. Uh, what, are, what are some of the different areas you get into? I think one of the biggest ones now is social media. And it's mm -hmm. not just that people are going online and looking at pictures of their friends' kids and posting pictures of their dinner. Right. It's that companies can use it and they can target a certain area. So I know your business, you're doing wealth management right. and advising and you're, you have certain demographics that you mm -hmm. focus on. So you could use something like Facebook. While you can't necessarily say how much money you made for somebody, right. what you can do is talk about a strategy for planning and you can pick demographics and target it. So you can pick a certain zip code right. close to your office. Mm -hmm. You can pick an age. So if you have a specific age, I think probably like 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. so you can pick a really tight window of age. And then on top of that, you can pick issues that people talk about, mm. retirement, college, divorce, marriage, new homes. Right. And then suddenly you're popping up in their feed and they're getting that recognition of, oh, hey, I recognize that right. guy. Oh, there's that guy again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think our industry is a little bit slow in that. Um, um, the whole there, there's a lot of regulations around what we can and can't do. So yeah, um, predominantly from what I've seen with our firm, it's it's predominantly LinkedIn that we we use. Um, but you know, hopefully that that changes. And certainly the the work that you do, I mean, that's how people get recognized. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you're if you're looking, first place everybody seems to go is 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 the web. And mm -hmm. um, if you can stand out, um, you're that closer to to growing your business. You are. So tell me about your business. Um, well, we uh, I get into a, a number of different areas. One big area that that's kind of you know kind of resonates is I help people. We call it the sandwich generation. People that are in their forties, fifties that um, kind of like myself have kid, kids going to college, mm -hmm. uh, are concerned about the cost of college, concerned about retirement. Well, how much is it now on average? Colleges uh, can range anywhere from uh, around thirty thousand dollars a year. Penn State. Penn State, uh, yeah, for Penn in State. state 30, yeah, in State, all in. Wow. To uh, some of the more expensive schools. I have a client who's going to Rensselaer up in New York State. That's $67,000 <laughs> this fall. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah, and so it's uh, quite costly. And, and um, you know, people are concerned about paying for college. Uh, they're, pay they're concerned about retiring. That on top of it, you know, a lot of them have, have parents that, that are that are transitioning to the next stage in life and um, um, you know, need help with uh, with those types of issues too. So we, we kind of help help clients with all those different avenues. But what kind of resonated uh, with what you said is, you know, where do you, how do you find somebody that helps people with all these different concerns? And on this TV show, apparently. <laughs> yeah, on a TV <laughs> show, right? But even like um, on websites, I mean, how mm. do you, you go and um, find somebody that, that might help with uh, with helping a, a parent transition to a continuous care retirement community. I mean, so I think that's where, you know, having people um, like yourself, having, having a firm like yours mm -hmm. help help uh, firms 
be able to position themselves on the web so that they're, you're easily found. Yeah, and I think part of the problem is that, and I see it with all my clients, they mm -hmm. have an, a term they believe is the right term. It's the, their industry term. Right. It's common language. You have right. it in yours. But the average person like me doesn't know that doesn't term. Know the jargon. It's all That's new, right. and I'm yeah. just searching help with mom moving to nursing home. Right. You know, I don't know how to search it, yeah. so you have to anticipate what they might potentially right. search and use Google's trend tools to figure that out and then put that content in your website yeah. so when people are searching on those obscure phrases right. that are not part of your common language, you'll pop up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Um, well, we have a, a really um, interesting guest coming up tonight, but before we get to that, um, mind taking a question from the audience? I would love to. Okay. So um, the question, Roger Dolman of Wayne asks, where do you see growth in the tech world? I think the quickest answer is wearable technology. Mm -hmm. I know that I have more than one smartwatch. Right. And I always want to get a new one. You know, I always want the biggest and best right. and greatest because I love gadgets like a lot of people in my space. But I see that you're wearing, is it a Fitbit? It's a Fitbit. Yeah. Right. And how long have you been wearing it? Uh, since my wife gave it to me for Christmas. <laughs> 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 yeah. So it's wearable technology. Yeah. People want the Apple Watch. It syncs to their phone. I have mm -hmm. a Garmin watch. It also syncs to my phone. Right. So people want these kinds of things that help them make their life better. And there's always that promise that if you're wearing that watch or that right. tracker, suddenly you're going to be healthier. Right. So it's sort of a, a marketing game. Right. Because I just don't wear it then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I get yeah, around it's that. It's a little bit like guilt. Big Brother, but, yeah. you know, keeps the peace. So that's so. what I would say, wearable technology. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, uh, if, if you would like to send a question... Um, here's how to send the question to Money Matters TV. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, TV dot com. Our guest tonight is Jim Wilton of Wilton & Associates. Welcome, Jim. Nice Thank to have you. you. Nice to be here. Fantastic. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself and your and your firm. Well, um, personally, I've been in and around the managed healthcare and wellness industry for about 30 years, and we've been working in helping companies that are concerned about the employees develop a program to improve and encourage them in becoming healthier. Good. Kind of intuitively, we know that if an employee is healthy and happy, he's going to be a better employee. Right. Unfortunately, up until recently, there hasn't been an awful lot of scientific evidence or studies that have demonstrated that this actually works. And in the last three or four years, they've been abounding. So actually, now you can go to the CFO and show him where there's going to be a good investment hmm. in investing in wellness for their employees. Makes a lot of sense. So my sister-in-law used to work for a big... Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say Atlantic Care, I think it was, down at the beach. And they had a big program where if you tracked your steps, and it was really, it wasn't connected to some fancy program. It was just you would come in on the honor system and say that you did a certain amount of activity. They gave you a discount on your health insurance. Mm -hmm. That's Is pretty that pretty typical. I yeah. mean, wellness programs are um, like a lot of things. If you've seen one, you've seen one. Mm -hmm. They're <laughs> out-of-the-box programs. Mm -hmm. There are things that are unique and customized. We call ourselves wellness architects, and the reason for that is because we work with companies on a uh, boutique basis to envision what they would like to see happen, to work with them in doing budget development. We can work with them on their health care uh, programming and what kind of benefits they offer. We can take a look at their claims data and find out where they're going to be best situated to impact the health of their population, something called population health that is 
very, very much in discussion these days. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, Jefferson has a, a school of population health down there that, uh, d that deals in these areas. So there's a lot of aspects, and it involves so many different variables that uh, it's kind of, in our opinion, difficult to say, I'll take the out of the box, the one thing, and just do that. Because we're trying to reach people and help them individually have that aha moment where they say, that's me. I've got to change. Mm -hmm. And when you can do that, you've accomplished a great deal because you'll change the person's life. Right. That's a lot of that know your numbers stuff, right? Absolutely. That's yeah. definitely part of it. All the buzz phrases that are around are all part of it. No mm. question about it. Know your numbers basically comes from biometric testing generally. And uh, those are terrific baseline measurements to both give an individual an idea of where they are from a health standpoint, but also to give an employer an aggregate number so they can you can actually do what's called risk stratification with biometric scores to find out the percentage of your employee population that ranges from minimal to extreme risk for chronic conditions. Hmm. You can also then isolate those chronic conditions and develop program around them so you can help people. I totally want to cut yeah. in. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm <laughs> going to cut you off because now right. I'm super interested. You have a, let's say somebody has a company with 100 people and you identify five or six people that are really high risk. Mm -hmm. And then now you're going to build programs around those five or six people that are high risk, whether it's diabetes or heart disease. But my question comes from another standpoint. If somebody gets fired, one of those five or six people, and they are high risk, does that open up the employer to Financial. potentially being sued? Yeah. yeah. It yeah. depends how it's done. And if the employer is doing it, it's going to depend on how they're doing it. Many companies will outsource to a company like ours mm -hmm. to manage all of that because we're not involved in the hiring or firing of anybody. And there are laws that protect personal data from ever going to anybody in a corporate environment. Aggreg aggregate data is all that can be shared. If the company is self-insured for their health care, then there are rules under HIPAA that allow for people who are actually administering that health plan to be what's called behind the firewall. They can see the data, but only for the purpose of administering the health plan. I lived there corporate for a long time. I couldn't hire or fire anybody. But what I tried to do is help employees that had problems address those problems and change their lives. Yeah, kind of a follow-up follow question. So <coughs> if companies are tracking, like on a Fitbit, mm -hmm. heart rate, um, all, these, all these different pieces of your, of your, of your puzzle, can they then go and, and um, reflect that, you know, those types of data in your premiums? Well, not on an individual basis. Again, and they probably shouldn't have individual data on any person. Hmm. It's going to be all aggregate data. So I it see. depends on how it feeds in. Um, and again, that's why sometimes they will outsource that stuff. Because we can look at it and say, you have... 40% of your population is diabetic or pre-diabetic. And it would be advisable for you to take a look at outsourcing management of those to personal health management or disease management, mm -hmm. as it used to be called. Right. Or they can actually do proactive intervention and help people either control their diabetic condition or prevent from becoming diabetic. And in some cases, with the proper program, you can get out of it altogether. You can move from diabetic to non-diabetic with the proper program. Yeah, because I've seen um, with helping clients and reviewing their, their medical insurance, <coughs> there's different bands based on different um, lifestyle habits. Mm -hmm. you know, if, you don't wanna c if you don't want to share any of your, your, your information, your premium is up here. If you want to share a number of different things, it can go down to here. Mm -hmm. Um, the premium set by the, the employer? Yeah, it's set by the set Well, it's a contribution. Employer. Right. It's a contribution. It depends, oh. again, whether you right. self-fund gotcha. or, or don't self-fund uh, your health insurance. Larger what does companies that mean, self-fund versus non-self-fund? For a company to provide health insurance, there are two ways to do it. I can either buy a health insurance policy from Blue Cross or Aetna or United mm -hmm. Healthcare, or I can be the health insurance company. I can pay all the claims myself oh, wow. as a company. That's called self-funding. And in this day, any company that can self-fund does because it gives you much more control and it's much less expensive. But you have to be able to bear the risk of those health care claims as they come in. And, and if somebody is self-insuring, can they get insurance for catastrophic events? Perfect question. Yeah, there's um, over coverage that comes in called stop loss. Mm -hmm. 
And so every company that self-insures has a stop-loss carrier. They have what are called attachment points that hit at a certain place where claims get above that, and now your stop-loss carrier picks up all of the claims above. So you have some insulation in your liability. That's neat. So do you help people identify the insurance programs they should be in based on their... If they like, yeah. if they like. And this is what we do for larger employers, a um, 1,000 employees um, or more than that, because that's where you can really get into having the opportunity to do some real change. Yeah. But the most interesting thing we're developing now, and I'm really excited about, is bringing a wellness program to smaller employers, because that's where the rubber hits the road. Most mm -hmm. employers are smaller in this country, and they don't have the resources to right. do this. So. We're developing a product which is a wellness education communications program that we're going to be able to bring to market hopefully in the fall for small employers so that there's no excuse anymore. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very affordable and it'll give everybody an opportunity to have something they can offer their employees in the wellness space. So it's education. What else is that? How else, what that else program, does that consist of? That program is exclusively educational. <coughs> um, the New England New England Journal of Medicine recently had an, a story that said that to impact a health population, it has to start mm -hmm. with education and it has to begin with imparting knowledge to people so they know what they're supposed to do and why they're supposed to do mm -hmm. it. That can be followed with program, but they showed that there's a 7 to 17 percent change just on the educational mm -hmm. piece if you can implement that type of program. This consists of um, topically arranged communications between 14 and 18 a month that mm. are targeted toward the risky behaviors, lifestyle choices people make that account for the 15 chronic conditions that drive 80% of our healthcare spend. What are some of them? Yeah. Oh, you can probably guess yourself. Yeah. Um, uh, poor the diet. Poor diet, okay. poor exercise, not enough sleep, stress management. Um, overuse of alcohol, tobacco use, of course. Mm -hmm. There's about eight of them in total. And if you can make a minimal change mm -hmm. in that risk stratification, right. you can tremendously impact both your healthcare spend, mm -hmm. but also the health of the population. Mm -hmm. And the really neat thing about this is it's contagious. Hmm. Once you start getting this into the population, the culture of a company, it catches on like wildfire. And it's just the most exciting thing in the world to watch. Hmm. So then I assume that people show up for work more often, less sick days? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You're tracking beautifully. They have done this in terms of productivity measurement, absenteeism, what's called presenteeism, which is a new term that means hmm. you're at work physically, but your head's not in the game. Something's going on. And consequently, all of these things are impacted and impacted very positively with a well-stratified and structured wellness program. That's really fascinating because yeah. just this small business thing, I'm a small business. I don't know how small your uh, business yeah, is, but business. when one person's out, the whole team suffers. Mm -hmm. So to increase productivity and somebody actually showing up for work and actually scheduling their time off to not be sick time, but to be a vacation, mm -hmm. what an amazing tool. Well, and it's part of what can happen, but communication studies have shown that for a person even to hear a message, they have to get it at least seven times right. in at least three different ways. So this package of, of communications that come out every month is privately branded for the company. You get your own wellness logo that goes on hmm. all the materials. So you have your own wellness program, and those materials are then generated around this topical theme to bring education to the employees that hopefully will trigger an aha moment, but it's very passive and mm -hmm. not aggressive. Right. It's kind of like constantly washing over you. For example, two of the things are screensavers, that if you can put uh, corporate screensavers up on company computers, they're just going to feed into the cycle. Right. So every two cycles, you're going to get a wellness message. It's just going to be there. Mm -hmm. And over time, it's just like waves washing over you. Yeah. So what does the subsequent years l look like with the, with the wellness program for, um, for small businesses? Well, for small businesses, it's... And how small? Uh, well, you know, the government defines it as 50. Um, we have packages that we try to make, again, strictly the communication, the educational pieces that we've structured in such a way that we try to make that affordable for businesses under 50 employees. Mm -hmm. um, we want to be able to help them. And that's what really drives us. We're passionate about getting this message so that we can 
figure out a way so that any employee, any individual can have that aha moment mm -hmm. where they say, ah, that's me. Small businesses obviously are going to have to figure out how they fit in the space, right. what they can afford to budget for wellness mm -hmm. programs, and then find a vendor that they can work with to help them achieve the best they can do with whatever their budget is. On a larger scale, the industry is moving into a much more expansive environment in two different ways. The subject of wellness is being expanded into well-being, which encompasses a lot more than physical health. Mm. It's emotional health, financial health, spiritual health. All of these things go into a composite holistically to help a person really be healthy in all these ways. From the standpoint of healthcare and wellness, we're integrating risk management into that equation. These are two different complete data sets that are siloed in most companies, but shouldn't be. You've got risk management that takes care of the workers' comp section right. and disability and all of that stuff. And then you've got HR that manages health care and manages benefits. Mm -hmm. And then you've got finance that has the payroll with all the absenteeism records. These don't get consolidated. Mm -hmm. When you can start breaking down the silos and bringing these together and taking the data from your third-party administrator that manages your workers' compensation program, integrating those with the data from the health care claims, and have an individual that understands both programs and take a look at those, then you apply, as I said before, the financial side, where am I spending my money, mm -hmm. and the clinical side, what's going on physically in these workers' comp accidents? Are these things that are repeatable? Are they sustainable? Mm -hmm. Can they be prevented? Because now we start talking <coughs> about preventing accidents rather than treating them after the fact. Right. And you can imagine if you can prevent right. something from happening, your savings are tremendous. It sounds like you're really focusing on, on a holistic approach to developing human capital of, of the personnel within within a company. Well, and also <coughs> more than that, I'm, I'm, I kind of bristle at the term mm -hmm. because to me it's about companies that care about their people. Right. They're a lot more than human capital. Right. Any company that I think has any insight at all realizes that their most valuable asset are their people. Mm -hmm. And as you said, if one person's gone, you're in trouble. Healthy and happy employees are right. the key to a successful business. Let me ask Absolutely. you a question slightly off topic. Yeah. Mm. I know certain countries are more successful at the way they treat their employees. And I think maybe Sweden. Have you heard about different countries and have you looked at what they're doing versus what we're doing in the United States and how to? I need to know a little more about what you mean in terms of treating their employees. I know in they don't Asia, I think they have things like, uh, there's, I don't want to misspeak, but maybe yoga and things like that that the community gets involved with. In Sweden, they might have something like eight or nine weeks or six, an obscene amount of vacation no. and a really huge maternity leave. Well, there are different companies domestically that do that. Yeah. Um, some of the tech companies have napping pods. <gasps> so hmm. that you can go in because it's been shown that a 20 right. minute nap during the day refreshes you to a point where your productivity increases uh, tremendously. They have yoga classes, they have meditation rooms. So a lot of companies do this. When I was corporate, we, I worked for a manufacturing mm -hmm. company. 85% of the employees were on the factory floor. Hmm. So we had some different challenges. Right. But we still, put together a high intensity interval training program that they went to after shift. You got them to stay and exercise? Yes, it was so wow. cool. Yeah, yeah. In fact, one of the factory f factory teams won the contest we put together and they got the t-shirts and uh, they were so happy and so proud. <laughs> That's wow. fantastic. Well, we're getting close to toward the end of our, our show, but we wanted to ask, um, what do you see for the future in this, in the, in, in the industry? Well, I think we've touched on it, but I think the, the wellness industry is in its, its birth stages. Right. One of the things that the Affordable Care Act did was greatly expand the accessibility of, of wellness programs into the corporate marketplace, into the employer space and health insurance. As it restricted other things, it expanded wellness. So this is a real positive. And I think as more of these studies are coming out, demonstrating that it's not just mm -hmm. intuitive, that it's factual, right. we'd look at the value of investment rather than return on investment. And when you look at the value of investing in your employees and what that can generate, mm -hmm. it's a tremendous return. That's, that's, that's phenomenal. Um, any uh, uh, 
last comments you just want to say? I mean, you know, um, about, about your firm? Well, not about the firm, yeah. but I'd encourage anybody, any employer out there, to take a look at uh, developing a corporate wellness program, a worksite wellness program for their employees. Because not only do you show people that you care and mm -hmm. is it the right thing to right. do, but the benefits of it are s expansive. They're right. just tremendous. Yeah. So. So the first steps would be to, to get in contact with somebody like yourself then, I guess. And it's a great it's, way to start. Yeah, it's for firms as small as just a couple of, you know, two-person sole proprietorship all the way up to Fortune 500, it sounds like. Well, yeah, and again, um, if you have a two- or three-person company, mm -hmm. the question is going to be whether or not there is enough money there to invest in even a simple program. Right. There's a lot of things you can do that are free. Hmm. and a lot of resources. The question is whether you have the resources in the company to be able to spend the time to develop those. Uh, lunch and learns, mm -hmm. hospital programs, all kinds of things that are free right. that people will come in and do for you if you have the, the personnel there to develop them. Right. Unfortunately, sometimes two and three employee companies can't afford that on their people or even to outsource it because right. they just can't afford the freight. It's unfortunate, and I wish they could. Right. But uh, then I'd be out of business. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a really a, a growing industry. It is. It is indeed. So, well, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, um, corporate wellness. That's that's uh, it, that's phenomenal. Well. Um, any clue? Any you have a, an, any other questions to to ask? I would just say, can you give us a couple health tips for employees about getting up from their desk or walking around? Well, I think the easiest thing to say is mm -hmm. that wellness can be summarized in two y two words, and they come from Hippocrates, who, mm. as you may know, was the father of Western medicine, the old Greek guy, and he wrote that if I can get everyone to get the right amount of exercise and the right amount of nutrition, not too little, not too much, we'll have found the safest way to health. And that's it in a nutshell, exercise and nutrition, the right amounts. And that's where you always have to start. So no candy dish at work is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going <laughs> to say that, but <laughs> moderation and balance. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's been a wonderful show. I really, really appreciate, appreciate having you on. Well, thank you for asking. <coughs> All right. That's it for our show today and what and next week our guest will be Jeff Stolman and he's from Rocky Mountain Tech Marketing so make sure to tune in for that and remember your money matters <laughs>